<clears throat> so we're going to continue to talk about cell therapy now. We're going to shift gears and go back towards regenerative medicine, which is a space that I really like. Um, Tygenics is a very interesting company, uh, certainly a public company in Europe. There are questions about where Tygenics will be in a year or two in the United States. Uh, and, and certainly has multiple strategies in the cell therapy space, some of which I think are very exciting. I think one of the challenges in regenerative medicine is that companies have got to deliver proof of concept and an indication, demonstrate to us that you have a product and that it works. Tygenics is very unique in that regard in that they are already commercializing cell therapy on one end, and on the other end, I believe that they're on the verge of proof of concept, not only in what I would consider to be Maybe it's unfair to call it a relatively simple indication, but also working in some very complex areas as well, which I'm sure will unfold as my friend here, Accordo, begins to present the slide deck to us. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I will do it from here. So um, for those of you who are not familiar, here's the uh, safe uh, Herbert statement. So we are a Belgian company headquartered in Leuven in, uh, in Belgium, but uh, with most of the operations in, in Spain, in Madrid, we're about 50 employees uh, quoted in the New York Stock Exchange in Brussels with a very uh, small market cap, about 120 million, which is uh, you know, very, very low when you look at the, uh, the uh, assets that we have in the company. We have a reference holder, which is Grifols, the uh, Spanish derivative company that owns about 21% of the company, and Novartis owns about 5%. Uh, we are well covered with uh, six analysts covering the stock, four of which are independent. And we announced uh, the uh, end of the year cash reserves, uh, almost 15 million. And on top of that, we've just raised uh, 27 million in a convertible um, uh, bond issue that is, has been taken completely by Grifols and that actually converts at a premium, at a 25% premium. So it's a uh, very non-dilutive. This is a very uh, busy slide, but hopefully summarizes what we're trying to do. So our key asset today is what we call CX601. So it's a, a allogeneic adipose-derived stem cells that we use for treating an orphan indication in Europe and a, a highly a, a medical need, which is complex perianal fistulas in Crohn's disease patients. Unfortunately, uh, compared with some of uh, my peers, we don't have a very glamorous disease to show pictures and videos. But I can tell you that this is a, a very debilitating disease. Uh, and also pretty large, despite the fact that it's orphan. 100,000 patients suffer from this complex perianal fistula every year, about half of which in Europe and half in the US. We had a, an open trial in a phase one, two clinical trial with uh, 24 patients in which we showed uh, that we could close 56% of those fistulas completely. This is uh, between two and three times what has been demonstrated by any standard of care. So with that, we went to the EMA and we uh, uh, have uh, finalized recruiting on a very large randomized double-blind placebo-controlled phase three trial that will read out in July, August of this year. So we will have data that will allow us, if positive, to file for approval in Europe. So we could be in the market as early as 2017 uh, with this allogeneic stem cell product. In the US, we've moved uh, very quickly this year, uh, or last year. We have uh, submitted an SPA for a second pivotal trial. That's the only trial that will be required to file a BLA in the US. Uh, we partner with Lonza to be our CMO uh, manufacturer in, uh, in, uh, in the US. And we hope to get approval before we get the readout of the European data. So hopefully by uh, the third quarter, we will have uh, started the tech transfer, we will have an SPA approved, we will have a positive one of the two pivotal trials, and we could eventually partner the company with someone that will know exactly what is required to get this product uh, on the market in the US. On top of that, we have uh, CX611, which is the intravenous delivery of these adipose-derived stem cells. We're targeting two very large indications. One is early rheumatoid arthritis. We did a randomized double-blind uh, placebo-controlled trial, phase one, two. In very refractory patients, the data was presented to the American College of Rheumatology with very significant effect. And we're moving now into a phase 2B in early rheumatoid arthritis that we expect to start at the end of this year. And in parallel, we started at the end of last year a phase 1 uh, mechanistic trial in sepsis. So we're giving volunteers a low dose of a lipopolysaccharide and looking at the, uh, at the effect 
of uh, giving the cells at the same time on the uh, cytokine cascade and the uh, sepsis-like uh, side effects that the, pay the uh, volunteers will get with the administration of the lipopolysaccharide. We will have those results in uh, June and we expect to move into a phase two trial before the end of the year. Finally, as, as Jason was saying, we have a product that is already on the market. We were the uh, first company to get a cell therapy product approved with a new legislation. This is Control Select for cartilage repair. We sold the manufacturing facility that we uh, built to a CMO. We licensed the compound to Swedish Orphan. So today we've significantly reduced our, our infrastructure and we have a 20% royalty stream that uh, provides just a, a nice cash inflow into the company uh, moving forward. Finally, I'm not going to go through all that slide. I can tell you that we have our own manufacturing facility that we uh, have demonstrated that we have a very reliable manufacturing that allows us to produce thousands of doses out of every liposuction of a healthy donor. We've been granted very recently a very important patent on the composition of the cells, on the composition of the product and the therapeutic uses in Europe. And we expect as well some uh, important IP news in the US in the weeks to come. Finally, as I mentioned, you know, we're well financed until the, at least the third quarter of 2016 with a reference holder that has demonstrated their support of the company every time that we needed it. And with that, Jason, I think that I will open the floor. For Good, thank you. If, would you go back one slide? Let's talk a little bit about the pipeline and let's first talk about perianal fistulas. Uh, I had some experience with Ventress and with Diltiazam and kind of the standard of care, uh, which is in the United States using compounding pharmacies, calcium channel blockers, and nitrodur, you know, which is marginally effective. Nothing is approved on label. Help me understand that when a person, you know, essentially has a tear in your anus, which can't feel good, right? Um, what, what happens? I mean, do, I guess one option is no treatment or kind of sitting on a donut, and then there's a surgical option. So, so let's go through kind of what is the standard of care today? So when you have, if you're a Crohn's sufferer and you have uh, one of these fistulas provided that they are complex, meaning that, you know, they are, they go through the sphincter or they are, you know, recurrent or they have a, a decent size. And, and again, people, underestimate how big those fistulas are, are and I can, I'm, I'm not going to, as I say, I'm going to spare you the pictures. Um, but you know, those are patients that can really sometimes do not go out of home just because you smell. So you know, you lose your, your stool content through, uh, through those uh, fistulas. And today, nothing really works. So a patient will go first through uh, antibiotics just to clean the fistula and avoid the infection that usually uh, goes with the fistula, then probably going to immunosuppressants, uh, which again has some ability to control the Crohn but very low healing rates on the fistulas. And in most of the cases, if the fistula persists, the patient may go through infliximab, which is the only approved product despite extremely low remission rates. Again, on the, uh, on the randomized clinical trial they did, after a year, only 20% of the patients had their fistula closed after a year. And if you wait a year longer, two thirds of those had their fistula reopened. So after two years, basically only like 7% of their patients had solved their issue. On very severe cases, you will, on, you will end up with surgery, something that doctors try to avoid. The quality of the tissue on a Crohn patient is, uh, is uh, because of the inflammation is very poor. So in about one third of the cases, you end up with anal incontinence. So again, if you talk with uh, gastric surgeons, this is a, a, an indication in which they say you lose your reputation because you have very few happy patients and very often you have a very unhappy uh, patient at the end of the treatment. So nothing really uh, cures today's those fistulas and I think that that's the big advantage of uh, 601. Great, thank you. And that's an excellent description. So now help me understand how a stromal vascular fraction or a heterogeneous AD post-derived cell therapy um, works. And I guess what I'm really asking you is, as you now kind of are embarking on a pivotal phase three program, how important was it to regulators for you to be able to elucidate the mechanism of action precisely versus just saying, hey, we know it's safe and, and we're getting a closure rate? So we've been working on this for 10 years. Uh, first with an autologous product that we, um, that we uh, developed all the way to phase three in uh, non coronal fistulas, and then since 2009 with the, uh, with the allogeneic version. 
What we've demonstrated, and there's plenty of publication, is that the cells, um, mesenchymal stem cells in general, and adipose stem cells in particular, have this ability of reducing and controlling uh, lymphocyte proliferation, which is uh, the key mechanism of, of uh, inflammation. So what we've demonstrated is with local administration, and 601 is locally administered on the uh, walls of the fistula, um, we significantly reduce or completely eliminate inflammation, allowing natural healing to happen. So the cells do not have an effect of grafting and growing. When we license the compound, that was the underlying mechanism of action, but today what we know is that the cells have this very potent, immediate anti-inflammatory effect that allows natural he healing to happen. And the good news when you have this natural healing is that the fistula remains closed. So the long term and the persistence of the closure is much higher. So, you know, so what I hear you saying is very exciting. Now, tell me a little bit about the phase two data and what the results were and why are you so convinced that you can replicate that phase two data now in a pivotal program? And in terms of the powering assumptions, how much wiggle room is there so that if in the, you know, because we know the rule of clinical trials. As you go up in number, you, you usually, your efficacy is not typically matched in what you saw in phase two. So help me understand the, the efficacy assumption, the powering assumption, and, and how much wiggle room you believe you have in this trial. So the uh, phase two was a non-controlled clinical trial. So we treated uh, 24 patients. Uh, we forced just to ensure that there was no doubt about what the effect of the cells was. We eliminated any Crohn medication eight weeks prior to starting the treatment with uh, 601. That, of course, produced a lot of flares of Crohn, and some of the patients you know, withdrew from the trial. But the, uh, of the patients that stayed, 56% of those that had at least that had one of their fistula tracts treated, closed their fistula. Seven of the patients had two tracts, and we only treated one. Zero percent of those seven closed the non-treated fistula. So we got 56% in the treated arm, zero percent in the non-treated arm. And I'm sorry, it's not a placebo control trial, but it's as, as good at, as it gets. What we're using is uh, for the uh, phase three clinical trial, we're using, even if we're going for Patients that are refractory to a standard of care were using the same placebo response that, that Infliximab uh, saw in, the, in, the, in their randomized clinical trials with non-refractory uh, patients, which is about 15%. And we're looking for a difference of 25%, absolute difference. So with an efficacy of just 40%, we will reach our statistical significance. And, and that's powered at our 90? 80%, 80 but okay, with a p-value of 0.025. Uh, that was uh, a requirement by the EMA as we were doing, uh, or we are going to be seeking approval with just one pivotal trial. And help me understand a little bit the switch you made from autologous to allogeneic. Why did you make that switch? I mean, we all understand that there's a lot of uh, logistical and cost of goods benefits, but do, does, I, I guess you've decided that allogeneic, there is no immune mediated response, or do you not see, are you going to be able to retreat these patients? So we, you know, we, we started autologous, then we, um, everyone was very scared about using allogeneic cells, then we've seen that some of the people were doing, and we started using allogeneic uh, cells. And, and today we've demonstrated with repeated dosing of these allogeneic cells through different routes of administration. So we have local, twice, intravenous up to three times, one week apart, so this is a pretty strong challenge, and even intralymphatic, which is the highest challenge that you can give because you go directly where the reaction should happen, again with two injections one week apart, without any significant um, uh, reaction. 601 is intended as a single dose, uh, six, uh, 611, which is the intravenous, is intended as a, as a three-dose uh, course. So um, indeed, that data is important, but we've seen that we do not elicit an immune response that produces any side effects. Okay, so here we have Tygenix, you know, about w really six months away from pivotal phase three data. And, you know, the question I have for you is on phase three data, right, that the w target market size here is what? large. Very large. Uh, and again, the only guidance that we've given w with very, very conservative numbers is that the product will do more than 300 million each side of the Atlantic. And this is with margins over 60%. 
So, you know, do the numbers. It's and three this is times a, your market cap today. This is uh, on each side of the Atlantic. That's pretty nice. Okay, I wish we had more time because I'd really like to talk about septic shock. I'd li really like to talk about rheumatoid arthritis, and I'd really like to talk about intravenous administration. But again, you know, one theme that seems to be emerging here is not a, really a question to, for me about whether whether cell therapy works. It's will the clinical trial be able to prove it? And what adjustments will you make? And here is a you know, European company essentially flying below the radar screen at a $100 million market cap on the precipice of phase three data that, that if it works, uh, you potentially have a share of a blockbuster market opportunity. Eduardo, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And thank you, everyone. Good afternoon.